Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. My name is Esther, and I'll be your host for today's session. We're so excited to have you join us for today's Facebook Live. It's going to be a great one. If you haven't written to us yet, please write to us in the comments section and let us know where you're tuning in from today. I see that we have Karen from Pennsylvania, uh, Lisa from Alabama, Louise from Scotland. We have Peggy from Oklahoma. So uh, please let us know where you're tuning in from today. We'd love to see all of our guests from all over the world in the audience. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we should get started any minute. Uh, we just want to give our guests a chance to join and uh, today we'll be talking about creating a digital genealogy workflow. We have with us a very special guest who we've never had before on a Facebook Live, on our MyHeritage Facebook Live, so we're super thrilled about today's session and I think that it'll be very useful and helpful for all of us in our genealogy work. I see Chris from Wisconsin, Linda from Florida, so thank you all for tuning in. I see Stephen uh, just wrote in and said he's counting down to the 1950 census. So we're all very, very excited about the release of the 1950 U.S. Census. We're all looking forward to all of our U.S. relatives uh, that we can find in the census that will be available very, very soon. As soon as it's available on the 1st of April, we will be indexing it here at MyHeritage. And that should be available on MyHeritage very shortly. So we are so thrilled about that. We have a few blog posts that have gone live recently all about the U.S. Census. Uh, the most recent one was about actors uh, that you'll be able to find in the 1950 U.S. Census, a few actors that made their debut in census records and the, in the 1950 U.S. Census. So a whole bunch of exciting things that we're looking forward to searching in the 1950 U.S. Census. We'll put a link to an interesting landing page that we've created here at MyHeritage about the 1950 U.S. Census. We'll put that in the comments section. So for those of you that are new to a MyHeritage Facebook Live, as always, please add your comments and questions in the comments section. We love to hear from you throughout the show. And we'll be taking questions at the end of today's session. If you miss any part of today's show or you want to rewatch it, because I'm sure there'll be a lot that you want to remember or, you know, rewatch and uh, get, get everything you can from today's session, you can do so. It'll be saved on the MyHeritage Facebook page under the videos section. So you'll be able to go back and rewatch today's session as well as all of our previous Facebook Lives. There are so many fantastic sessions by genealogists all over the world who have come to speak about my heritage tools and features, about DNA, about genealogy, uh, just lots of amazing sessions there. And there, each one of them is worth watching more than once. So definitely make sure to check it out. Um, before we get to today's session, I'll just tell you all about a giveaway that we have for today's show. We'll be giving away one MyHeritage complete plan to a viewer in the audience. So to enter, all that you have to do is just let us know your best organizational tip <laughs> that you may have, whether it be uh, something genealogy related or even in life, <laughs> your best uh, tip for organization. And uh, let us know in the comments section. And we'll choose one lucky winner to win a complete plan on MyHeritage. That's the best plan that we have to offer on MyHeritage. We have almost 17 billion historical records, and uh, the complete plan will give you access to all those records. It'll give you unlimited family tree size, access to all of our photo tools, a lot of amazing, amazing photo tools that we've come out with over the past couple of years. Uh, and much, much more. So a great prize <laughs> worth winning. Uh, so leave us a comment in the comment section. Let us know your best tip uh, for organization, uh, whether it be for genealogy or just in general in life. And we'd love to hear from you. 
So now I'm going to introduce our speaker today. We have with us Janine Adams. She is a professional organizer and an avid genealogist. They can go hand in hand. <laughs> she started the blog Organize Your Family History in 2012, and she shares information and resources to help you stay happy and focused all while exploring your roots. She's based in St. Louis, Missouri, and she has presented at Roots Tech twice, as well as at smaller conferences and society meetings, and she has hosted two workshops for Family Tree University. She embraces digital organizing of her genealogy research, and she writes about it on her blog. We'll put a link, actually, in the comments section, so you can also check out her blog. And uh, you could definitely sign up for her email list as well at that link. So we'll put that all in the comments section and you can check it out. And now let me bring her onto the screen to say hello to everyone. Hello, Janine. Hey, Esther, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? Good, I'm so happy to be here. We are so thrilled to have you. And uh, we were just chatting before the show about how excited I am about this session. <laughs> oh, good, that makes me happy. I'm so thrilled and I'm sure we'll all learn a lot of um, hints and tips and, and ways that we can stay focused uh, with our workflow. Great. Fantastic. So do you want to bring up your slides and we'll get them into the, into the window? All right. Let's see if I can do this. Okay. I I yeah, I think that's, that's great. Let's just get it up here. There we go. You're all set. Fantastic. All right. So should I take it away? Yep. yep. Okay, terrific. So as I said, I'm so excited to be here. I appreciate my heritage inviting me to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, which is organizing your genealogy dig digitally. Um, as Esther mentioned, I am a professional organizer. I'm actually a certified professional organizer, and I own a company in St. Louis called Peace of Mind Organizing. I started it in 2005, so I've been doing this a while, and my team and I go into people's homes, and we help them create order. So it's loads of fun, um, and I love genealogy research. I've been, I got serious about my uh, own genealogy research in about 2011, and in 2012, I started my blog, Organize Your Family History, because it sort of marries my two passions, right? Genealogy and organizing. So um, I write there about twice a week. I try to write there twice a week, I should say. Um, so there's lots of content for you to explore if you're interested in checking it out later on. Um, but so now I just want to sort of dive into what we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to talk to you about why I think Digital is better than paper for your genealogy research. Um, my digital workflow for processing documents that I find online, that's gonna be the meat of the, of the talk. Um, I'll get into my file naming protocol and my folder structure. I'm gonna talk a bit about Evernote, which I love because it helps keep me paperless. Um, I'll talk about where to store your files, the various options for storing your genealogy files, as well as backing up because of course that's so important. And then, if you are hearing all this and wanting to get into organizing your, um, your genealogy research digitally, you might feel a little overwhelmed. So I wanna talk a little bit about avoiding that overwhelm. So I imagine that you're at this talk because you're actually interested in digital organizing of your genealogy research. But just in case there's people there who are on the, on the um, Brink, you can't decide whether or not to do it. I wanted to go through some of the reasons I think that digital tops paper. So here are some of the benefits to downloading a document rather than printing a document. I or I do almost all my genealogy research online, like probably many of you. Um, I do go into repositories sometimes, but pretty much everything is online. And back when I started, I would print the documents um, because I was afraid to organize genealogy digitally, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to organize paper. But I came to discover that there are so many benefits. So here are some of them. Of course, it's quicker, right? It's much easier to download a document and file it on my hard drive than it is to print it out and file it into a binder or a folder. It's less expensive because there's no paper, there's no toner, there's no ink, no file folders, no binders. All I have to pay for is um, document storage, which is 
not very expensive. Um, it saves space. Again, no bookshelves full of binders, no file cabinets full of files, no big pile of papers to be dealt with, because <laughs> um, I think we're all familiar with that pile. So it's definitely a space saving thing. And it's also easier on your eyes. When I was printing out census reports, or, you know, sheets, say, 10 years ago, and I was in my late 40s, I couldn't see them. Because one big sheet on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So I had all these magnifying glasses and it was really challenging and it made genealogy less fun. So now I download a document, I pull it up on my screen. I use a MacBook Pro laptop, but I have a 27 inch monitor that I attach to it. So I can see everything and I can zoom in on anything. And it's just so much easier and so much easier on my eyes, which have not gotten any better over the last 10 years. I say that it saves your back because you don't have to haul around files or binders. If you're going to a repository to do research, you don't have to think about which files do I need to take along that I'll need to access because everything's on your computer or on your phone even, depending on how you're storing your files. So the portability of it is tremendous. It's made my research trips much easier. And finally, it's so much easier to share digital documents with others uh, than paper documents. With paper documents, you have to photocopy and perhaps mail or scan and email. But with digital documents, they're already um, scanned, right? So uh, it's just a matter of emailing or sharing a link or something like that. And that's why I like digital. And this is why I like a digital workflow, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Because if you write down your workflow, if you have a step-by-step -step process, you're going to do it the same way each time which not only makes everything more consistent, it makes it easy to implement. And the beauty of it is it becomes automatic. Anything that you do regularly, you get your, it, you just get into the groove of it. I can, I have a seven step process that I'm about to share with you and I go through it without thinking, you know, I've been doing it for years. So I do it without even thinking about it. And that's when things get easy. And that's what I love. Easy is what I love. I have a motto, literally, it's on my bulletin board. It's let it be easy. And I think that creating a digital workflow allows processing those documents to be easier. Because I know a lot of us, we love the search, right? We're here for the thrill of the hunt. And when we find that document, um, sometimes we just want to move on to the next search. But what we, But we're losing out if we're not actually analyzing each of the documents that we find and, and entering the information somewhere. So a digital workflow will allow you to make that process easy so that you can get back to your fun searching on my heritage or wherever else that you're searching. So I wanted to take you through my digital workflow. And I want to make very clear that I'm going to show you what I do. But I'm not saying it's how you need to do it. It, my digital workflow, which I worked out over the years for myself, works really, really well for me. And it could work really well for you, but also maybe it wouldn't. Maybe you think differently or you've started out uh, doing things differently and don't want to change. And that's, that's just fine. My hope is that you will glean some things during this talk that will allow you to make any course correction with your own workflow or allow you to create a new workflow from scratch with more ease. So... Again, I even in my organizing clients, I don't tell someone how to how to organize their spices. <laughs> I just talk about how they use their spices, and then we figure out the best way for their spices to be organized. That's how that it is with genealogy as well. So take this as a um, a living example of what I do, and then um, you can run with that. And there, as Esther mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat. I don't see the chat right now, but at the end of the talk, then I'm happy to take any questions that you have. So first thing I need to let you know is I store all my genealogy information on in my software reunion on my Mac. It's a Mac-only uh, family tree program. It's the only one I've ever used, <laughs> but I love it. And so I don't know what I don't know, but um, I think it's great. You may be using something else like Family Tree Maker or Roots Magic or whatever you're using. Um, the, the examples, the screenshots I have here in this talk are all reunion based, but I'm hopeful that the concepts would apply to other software. So all my, all my data is in reunion. I do have a tree at MyHeritage, at Ancestry as well, but my focal point is um, 
ring and, and that's where everything is up to date. So um, that's just how it works, how I like to do it um, because I, I like to hold things close, I guess. <laughs> so as uh, let me take you through my digital workflow and you can see how it's gonna go. Um, so these are the seven steps. I'm gonna go through each step. I find a document online and I download it. I immediately rename it and save it to a folder on my hard drive called surnames. I add a fact from the document into my database on reunion and I, at that moment, create a source citation. I paste the source citation into the metadata of the document, the file itself, and then I link the document into the multimedia section of the source record in reunion. So the two places where I'm storing stuff are talking to each other. I then go back to the document. I keep finding all the inf interesting information and adding that data in reunion. And for every fact I add from that document, I use that same source citation. And the last step is I file the document in my folder structure. And then that document is processed. The information's available to me. It's all organized. So I'm gonna take you through the seven steps for, for this purposes of this talk. The example I'm going to use is one I just downloaded last week um, because I'm preparing for the U.S. Census to come out on Friday. I um, am trying to gather as much information as I can about how uh, where my people lived in 1950. So I went to my heritage and I looked for um, information for my great aunt. She's my father's aunt, Doris Adams Delgado, who um, I wanted to see where I might find her in 1950. My heritage has a city directories collection. So I found a city directory for Doris and her husband, John Delgado, and I downloaded it. So that's that was step one. I found it and I downloaded it. And then step two, I immediately rename it. So the, um, the format I use for my file names is year, type of document, then I put in a hyphen, and the name of the person I'm researching is in that document, another hyphen, and locality. So for this um, city directory uh, page I found, it's 1943 city directory, Doris John Delgado, Berkeley, California. Um, what I like about that is it's simple, so it's easy for me to remember and be consistent. It's also descriptive. I can tell at a glance what's in that file without opening it. I used to, when I first was trying to develop this, I had a more complex file naming protocol that put more information in the file name, but I could never remember it. <laughs> I couldn't remember what it was and I'd have to look it up. And so I settled for something more simple. So, but it's got just enough information. And the reason that I start each file name with the year is that my files, as you'll find out in a minute, are all going to be in the individual person's folder. So if they start with a year, when I look in that folder, they're all arranged chronologically. So that's really handy to see what I'm missing or to easily put my mouse on a particular document. So that's step two, I rename the document immediately. Here's the thing, that piece of training, the fact that I've trained myself to do that instantly is hugely helpful because typically these documents that we download have these long alphanumeric file names that um, we would never find, right? They don't make, they're not descriptive. And that was the thing that really stopped me from going digital at the very beginning. Those file names scared me and I was afraid I would just lose them on my hard drive. So by renaming them instantly, I will, um, I can always find them. And that's hugely helpful. So that's an important step. So in step three, I find a fact in the document. So I, I click on the document, it opens up in my PDF reader, which is called preview. And I find a document, I just pick one. I mean, a, a fact. And then I add it to that person's record in reunion. So in this case, I noticed that the city directory said that John Delgado was a shipyard worker. I had, I did not know that. Um, so I went into, into reunion. I and went into John's record. I clicked on facts and under facts of the occupation. And I wrote shipyard worker, parentheses, 1943. And then I created the source citation. I never enter anything into reunion unless without creating a source citation. So that's another habit that's just really, really important. I use um, 
the reunions templates to create my source citation. So this is a book. So I use the book template and filled in the various fields. I also always enter the URL. Even in fact, I'll add the field location of source if it's not in the template because um, it can make it really easy to find the document again. Now I do understand that URLs can break. So um, I know it's not, I know better than to have only a URL but I keep the URL in there just to make it easier on somebody I might be sharing this with later or easier on myself if for some reason I need to click on it. Typically I wouldn't because I've already downloaded it. But anyway, that's why the URL is there. And I do know that they break. Although to be honest, they they seem to last a long time. I haven't had a lot of, found a lot of broken URLs in my source citations. And I also put the date I viewed the document, the date I found it, because that becomes interesting down the road when I can look back and see that I, um, discover I found this document let's say it was in 2012 back when I wasn't a particularly good researcher and then I might know that that's a clue I should look a little harder at that source and make sure there aren't I didn't leave any information on the table um, oh and this is a good place to mention that I am not a stickler for formal source citations again I'm not telling you what to do but in my genealogy life I am a hobbyist, I'm not a, a, a professional researcher, and I want to make it easy to create source citations. And I know that if I were trying to craft an evidence explained worthy source citation for every source, I would probably not be enjoying my research as much and probably wouldn't be researching as much. So I have this talk I give called The Imperfect Genealogist. I'm all about letting go of perfectionism. In fact, I have a podcast with a life coach called Getting to Good Enough which is about letting go of perfectionism so you can do more of what you love. So I talk a lot more about good enough source citations in that talk. But just so you know, just putting in a plug for the importance of a source citation. But in my opinion, let this creating the source citation be easy so that you're able to do it uh, and keep yourself happy. Okay, enough. I'll get off that little soapbox. So I've added a fact, I've created the source citation. The next thing I do is I copy the source citation and I paste it in the metadata of the document. Now this is the step that's probably least crucial of my seven steps. It's handy to have it in the metadata. I don't know that it's essential. And the way I do it is that I, there's a little clipboard. You can see I put a red arrow pointing to it uh, above the preview pane in the source record in Reunion. I click that and that copies it to the clipboard. Then I go over to Finder, which is where Mac files are organized and I, control click on the file name and that brings up the metadata um, and in the comments area of the metadata so you see that on the right part of the screen that's where I paste uh, the source citation and then I uh, and then it's there later on if I'm wondering which source this particular document was I, that's an easy way for me to find it I think in uh, Windows uh, they call uh, they call that properties um, so that's where you would you would look to paste it if you were going to do that in Windows and then the fifth, the fifth um, step is a really important step. I drag the file from the finder into the multimedia section of the source record in Reunion. This is great because what this does is it allows me, if I'm looking at the source record, to just click on that and see the document. So sometimes I'll think, where did I get that information? And I look at the, the source, but I still don't remember it. And I thought, oh, I better check my work. And I'll click on the document and look again. Um, and because it's here in Reunion, that means it also is available on my phone if I'm not at my computer, if I'm out in the world. So that's really, really handy and really important, um, an important part of the process. So once I have done that, then I go back to my PDF reader and I just take every bit of information I can find from that document and add it to Reunion, right? Pick all the meat off the bones. So in this case, um, there was a, uh, the city directory had an address for John and Doris. So I added it to John's record and I also added it to Doris's record. So this is the events pane in Doris's record in Reunion. So I just added residence 1943, Berkeley, Alameda County, California. And then I put in the memo section, the street address, which was on the, um, in the city directory. And of course, then I click, oh, you can't see it on here, but I click add source. It's, it's below uh, the screenshot, and then I add um, source 1440, which was the source that I created when I found the city directory. 
And then when I uh, have taken all the information I can, I feel like I'm done. The last step is to file the document. So before I get to that seventh step, I wanted to talk a bit about my folder structure. So I already told you my file naming protocol. So I have consistency in the file names. And then when it comes to, fi to file the document, if I file it in my folder structure, this is what I do. Again, it may, be not, may not be what you do. And if what you do is working for you, that's great. But I just wanted to share my folder structure, which is working out well for me. So for my direct line ancestors, I um, have a folder called surname. It's in, um, it, that's the folder that I saved the individual document to on my hard drive. And within the surname folder, I have individual surnames. So Adams, Jeffries, Rasco, et cetera. So those are my family surnames. And then within each surname folder, I have a folder for the person with their year, with their name and their year of birth and the year of death. So for example, um, my, my great aunt Doris, her grandmother was my gr second great grandmother, Henrietta Adam McEwen Adams. I, um, uh, so her folder name is, she's in the, it's Adams for the Adams folder, Adams parentheses McEwen comma Henrietta 1847 to 1902. So you might notice that I use married name and with birth name in parentheses rather than the other way around. Um, I chose to do this because it made sense to my way of thinking to have them, to have the women in their uh, family groups, in those, their folders. So that's what works for me. I wrote a blog post about this last year, which I then sort of re-ran just yesterday. Um, we're asking to explain what I do with married women and asking readers what they do. And I learned that I'm uh, everyone who commented said, oh, I, I organize by uh, birth name. So if that's what you do, great. I and mean, if that's what's working for you, great. This works well for me. Um, it's just what I thought to do at the time I created my folder structure. Uh, so I'm sure there's pros and cons of both. Um, so that's the direct line ancestors. After I started research in a while and had a lot of files, I, a lot of folders, I decided to separate my collateral relatives from my direct line ancestors in my folder structure to make it easier to, um, for me to, to hone in, especially on my direct line ancestors. So um, I have a, I just, all I did was embed a folder called collateral under that surname folder. And then I, I carry on the same way. So collateral, uh, and then the name, the surname, the actual name of the, the line that the person's in, and then the name of the person, year of birth to year of death. And, um, you know, it's, it's probably obvious, but the reason I have the birth year and death years is to help differentiate between the people who have the same names. Um, so for Doris Adams Delgado, her folder is under collateral Adams, because that's that's the family line that she's a part of. Delgado, because that's her last name. Delgado, parentheses, Adams, Commodores, 1902 to 1990. I hope that makes sense. Um, and if you have questions about it, feel free to ask in the chat. and We'll get to them uh, at the end of this talk. But I, here's it. I'm just, just to try to show it a different way in case, just to make it a little more clear. My direct line ancestors with the example of Henrietta McEwen Adams, have their own, they're under the surnames, and it's just pretty straightforward, their last name and then their name. Um, but for my uh, collateral lines, they're embedded in a, they're in a, a, first a collateral folder, then the name that is the line that they belong to, even if that's not their last name, and then their last name and their name. Okay, so um, here you can see it in action. Step seven, file the document. You can see that uh, Doris, Doris's folder, which is over there on the right, um, is under collateral Adams Delgado, Delgado Adams, comma, Doris, 1902 to 1990. So all I do is drag it from, it's going to be um, up there above at the top. Since I, I download into the surnames folder, the individual files just sort of hang out there at the top of the, of the uh, list until I file them. So I just dragged it from the top of the list over to her folder. I don't have a folder for John Delgado, only because this is the first thing I have found, I think, for him. So until I have more, I probably 
I'm just going to leave him there indoors, leave him alone. But if I create another folder for, if I do create a folder for him, it would be right there in the Delgado folder. And I would just copy that city directory and drag it into his folder, his personal folder. Okay. So let me just summarize my digital workflow. Um, I find and download the document. I rename it and save it in the surnames folder. I add a fact to reunion that I found in the document and create a source citation. I paste that source citation into the metadata of the document. I drag the document over into the source record multimedia section. And then I continue to extract data from that document using the same source citation for each fact. And then when I'm done, I file the document. And then I know that the, that is fully processed. All my bases are covered and um, I, I know I can find it. Like the fear of losing things on my hard drive is gone. The other thing I wanna mention is I always, I, I never file the document until I have actually processed it. By processing it, I mean that I have taken all the information from it and entered it into reunion. Because if I were to file it first when it was unprocessed, I probably would never remember that I needed to process it. So what happens is I end up with a group of uh, individual files that need to be processed hanging out there in my surnames folder. Um, and I try not to have too big a backlog, but sometimes it gets big. <laughs> um, right now it's not, which feels really good. Uh, so that's my digital workflow, seven steps that are now automatic. And it keeps me feeling really comfortable and happy and organized and it makes my genealogy life easy. Uh, so I'll look forward to hearing if you have any questions about that. And again, just feel like I need to say it again. I am not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what I do and how well it works for me. So let's talk about Evernote for a minute because Evernote is a great tool to gather information without having to have paper around. So in case you're not familiar with Evernote, it's a platform that sensibly is for note taking that um, is syncable among devices. Here, is, here are the reasons I think Evernote rocks. It's, it's simple. It's got, you, you have notes that are organized into notebooks. You can organize notebooks into stacks. I have a stack of marketing called Genealogy that has a bunch of notebooks in it. Um, but beyond that, it's not super, it's not, doesn't have a complex organization structure. You can tag things to sort of cross reference, which is really handy. It syncs between my devices. So that's great. So um, if I have my phone with me, which I always do, I can see everything that's in my Evernote, no matter where I entered it. It's searchable and it searches quickly. So that's great. And if you have the premium version, it even, you can even search handwritten notes, which is, blows my mind. I think your handwriting has to be somewhat legible, but if it is, then you can search your handwritten notes. And it's really easy to add notes to Evernote because they, you can type it into it, you can dictate audio files, you can um, take photos from within the app, um, or you can uh, just load photos from that you've taken elsewhere. You can just uh, uh, clip uh, links to websites right into Evernote so you can get back to them. You can add documents if you want. I know some genealogists will use Evernote as their file storage for their digital documents. I, I went to a great talk on that years ago and I tried it and it didn't work for me. So I, I stopped doing that, but that's another way you can use Evernote. And it's free. Um, um, there are premium versions and um, I actually do pay for Evernote uh, because it has the premium version I use allows me to use it without uh, having to be on the internet, which is great if I am in some place remote that doesn't have cell phone service or on an airplane. So um, if you're a power user like me, I mean, I'm not really a power user, but I use it a lot. Um, I'm happy to pay whatever it is I pay, 50 or $75 a year for it. But there's a great free version. You don't have to pay for it. So I use Evernote for all sorts of things in my life, uh, not just genealogy, but here's how I use it for genealogy. I use it as my research log. I have, have a very rudimentary research log. It's nothing to be proud of, but it works for me. All I do is I have a notebook 
called, well, this year's is called 2022 Research Log. And every time I research, I start a new note with the date on it. And then I just freeform write what I did. I tried more formal ways to do it. I never kept up on a research log. This is so easy that I actually do it. And the thing that I always do <clears throat> that is the most helpful is at the end of the session, I always write next actions or next steps. So I can write down where I left off. And then when I go to research, all I have to do is open up the pre most recent note and see where to get how to get started. So I no longer have that, oh, what am I gonna work on today? Uh, feeling that I used to have that used to overwhelm me. And then sometimes I didn't research at all because I didn't know what to work on. Those days are gone thanks to my really, really simple Evernote research log. I use it to clip websites. If I find out about resources, I can just put them in Evernote, super easy. I use Evernote for my conference notes. So I will typically make a notebook for a conference, an individual conference, genealogy conference, and then have a note for each session that I attend. I just type in the notes as I listen, um, works out really well. And it's searchable, so it's really easy for me to find those notes later if I need them. I use it for planning my research trips. It's great. So it's a great place to put, if I have a, a research trip that I, I'm hoping to do, say, next year, let's say I'm going to go to Kentucky, which is probably where I'll go when next time I take a research trip, I can just put things in Evernote that come to mind or if I see a resource or a graveyard or um, an event, I can put it in a Kentucky research trip notebook. And then when it comes time to actually plan the notebook, the research trip, I have a place where I can really get all my logistics in one spot. And since I don't even have to have internet access to open it, um, it's really great if I find myself in like a remote cemetery or something with no internet access um, or no cell service. So, it's a great way to gather those notes. I can put who um, at a cemetery I want to find, right? And then I can, um, I don't have to have internet access to have that list in front of me. And I don't have to carry paper with me. The other, another great way I use Evernote is I keep a library lookups folder, I mean notebook. And um, if I am home doing research and I go on family search and I find the document and it has a lock next to it, I know that I can't actually see the document unless I go to the library that is an affiliate library. I just, I, I get over my disappointment and I add it to my library lookup list note, note. And then next time I'm at the library, I have a list of things to look up. It's fabulous. It just makes everything easy. And it, you know, I could do that in a, in a notebook, which is fine, but that means the notebook has to be handy and I have to have it with me when I go to the library. And Evernote is always there because it's on my phone, which is frankly always with me. I also keep follow-up notebooks in Evernote for um, to help keep me focused. Um, I keep them by surname. So if I am trying to answer a research question, let's say it's about an Adams, and I come across something juicy about another family line, let's say it's the Rascos, um, instead of going down the rabbit hole and away from my research question, I can just go into Evernote and put a note in the Rasco a follow-up notebook, maybe a link to the thing that I found to get me started there. So that calms my mind down because I know it's safe, I won't forget about it, and then I can get back to what it is I'm supposed to be working on. So that's really helped my helped me maximize my productivity during my research sessions. I find it really handy. Um, and finally, one way I use Evernote that helps me in my genealogy life is I use the reminders. So um, if I sign up for a a subscription to a, a genealogy website um, and I know it's going to uh, expire in six months and be automatically renewed, I'll set a reminder in Evernote, let's say a week before the um, renewal and remind myself that that's happening so I can make a decision about whether or not to renew it. Because of course the problem is if you sign up for something and then you never use it, you're not going to remember about the renewal and then next thing you know you're paying for it again and you haven't used it. So this is a great easy way to keep me from doing that. And it just sends me an email the morning of the, the day the, the reminder is set for. And then I can deal with it that day. I give myself a week so that uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't get too urgent, doesn't feel too stressful. So there are other um, platforms that are similar to Evernote, like OneNote, um, which I understand is great since I use a Mac. Uh, I don't use OneNote because at the time I 
I was making a decision it wasn't available for Mac. I also use Trello for a lot of stuff. I love Trello. I just don't tend to use it for my genealogy life as much. I think that's probably just because Evernote is working so well for me. So I love it. And it Evernote plus my digital workflow really helps keep my um, keep me focused and keep my genealogy life uh, paper free. So I wanted to touch on where these precious electronic documents that you're storing um, might be kept. You have a few options, and it's really up to your individual sensibility sensibilities about where you want to keep them. So you can have local storage, like your hard drive. Of your computer, that's what I do, because I like it. I like to be the one in control of it. Um, so it's uh, so that's what I do. I store it in my hard drive, but of course I have to back it up because it makes it because hard drives fail. Um, you can also store it in the cloud, like an iCloud or Google Drive, um, Box. There are you know places online cloud storage that could work instead of your hard drive if you wanted. Um, and there's a lot of, it makes a lot of sense to do that in terms of having easy access to your documents, um, except you have to have internet access to, to access them. And you, um, you have to trust that they're going to be okay there. <laughs> so I have this weird distrust of the cloud. It's not reasonable. Um, maybe it's because I'm old, but I have this, my feeling is like, the bad guys are going to take out the cloud and then my genealogy research will be lost. And that's not tenable to me. So I prefer to keep it on my hard drive. There are also synchronization services like Dropbox that allow you to um, store information on your hard drive and then synchronize it in the cloud so that you can access it elsewhere. So I do that with Reunion. Reunion has an app called Reunion Touch. It's a little, it, it's not free, but maybe it's 10 bucks or something. And, um, it has you store your reunion files in a Dropbox folder that the Reunion Touch app accesses. So uh, my stuff's on my hard drive. It's synchronized in the cloud. Um, and I have access to it on my devices as well as on my computer. So for me, that works out well. Um, so you don't have to choose one. You can mix and match like I did with my local storage and synchronization. But no matter what, if you're storing your documents electronically, you must back up. You must. So um, that's one of those things that isn't like a future possibility. Oh, yeah, one of these days I'm going to back my stuff up. No, you need to be doing it now. And I suggest that you back up to at least two places, if not more, because something will go wrong. It's not, as they always say, it's not a matter of if your hard drive will fail. It's a matter of when your hard drive will fail. So what I do is I back up my hard drive to the cloud using Backblaze. Um, happens constantly, I think. I mean, I, uh, every, I'm, I'm not sure, actually. I think it happens constantly. Whenever I change a document, it gets changed in the cloud. I spend $60 a year, I think it is, for that. Um, I also have an external hard drive that I use Time Machine to back up my hard drive. So it's this external hard drive is plugged into my monitor. And when I put my computer down at my desk, I plug the monitor in because I want the big monitor. So it, it automatically then is updating my backup. Um, I had a, a hard drive crash. Uh, or actually, that wasn't what it was. I had my computer die in October this 2021. One day, my computer just went dark and it would not come back. So I took it to um, the Apple store. They had to send it to geniuses in Texas. And I was without a computer for about a week. Well, it felt like a week. It may have been more like five days. But thanks to my backing up, uh, everything worked out okay. I was able to use my husband's uh, iPad and go on to Backblaze and cherry pick the files that I needed. So then I just downloaded them to the, the iPad. And then when, it, when I got my computer back, it was like new. I mean, literally like new. They had overwritten, they had installed a new um, operating system and none of my files were there. So it was up to me to load my files back on. And it was easier to do that with Time Machine and my hard drive than it would have been to do it with Backblaze. It would have taken a long time in Backblaze. So um, I have this living proof that having two types of backing up saved my bacon. And um, I'm so grateful for it. So I urge you, if you either are or are considering to organizing your files digitally, to have a really good backup plan in place and, and do it. 
Um, and sometimes I'll hear from people, oh, no, I would never do my, I would never organize digitally because hard drives fail. And I got to keep it on paper. And my response to that is, well, paper is vulnerable as well. You can have fire, you can have flood, you can have earthquake. I mean, tornadoes here in Missouri, there's all sorts of things that could destroy your paper. So um, in fact, it, 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 because it's so easy to back up your hard drive, I tend to think that um, digital is safer. So we're coming to the end here. I want to help you feel not feel overwhelmed if you are thinking about starting the process of going digital with your genealogy research. Here's what I suggest you do. Don't think, okay, I'm gonna start scanning all my documents and then I'll go digital. Instead, decide, okay, today is the day I download instead of print. And have your file naming protocol in, in place, decide how you wanna name your files, have your folder structure in place, and then the next document you find online click download instead of print, and then process it using your digital workflow. So then once you've got that going, you can work on your backlog of paper files if you'd like. The, um, I urge you to do that a little bit at a time so it doesn't feel so overwhelming and so that you can celebrate little victories. So you could do one folder at a time, one person at a time, one section of a notebook. Or you could use your timer, which is one of my favorite tools. Um, and set a timer for like 30 minutes or 15 minutes, or five minutes if that's what you need to get started, and just uh, scan and rename your files and, and file them from that uh, for that amount of time and then celebrate your success. If in, you're in the process of this and you have reason to access a paper document, go ahead and scan it while it's out, because then you'll have scanned the documents that you're using and the new ones that you're getting, and eventually all your documents if you decide to scan it all. Keep your system simple, I, I, simple is good. The simpler you can make it, the easier it will be to do, and the more likely it is you'll do it and enjoy doing it. And remember, use my processes as suggestions, not rules. I'm not telling you what to do or how to do it. I'm telling you what works for me, and I want you to do what works for you. So I'm hopeful that you can take at least parts of this and apply it to your situation and not get in knots about it. Um, because really what you want to do is let it be easy. Easy equals fun. <laughs> and ease, taking the easy way out, in my opinion, is the best way to do it. So um, remember that. Let it be easy. This doesn't have to be hard. I wanted to let you know that I do have this orderly roots guide called How I Do It, a Professional Organizer's Genealogy Workflow. Um, it's 37 pages long. It's a downloadable PDF, 1999. If you've feel like you want to dig deeper on this, that's a great way to dig deeper. Um, it's one of four guides I've written that I've bundled into a bundle called the Orderly Roots Bundle that's $39. All of those are available at organizeyourfamilyhistory.com. And uh, if you need, would like to reach, to talk to me, reach out to me, go to organizeyourfamilyhistory.com and you can send me a note through the contact uh, form. Um, please feel free to sign up for my free email list while you're there. And uh, it will send, you'll get a, a series of emails and then you'll get a monthly email that lists the blog posts that I've, um, that I've written that month. And you, if you're interested in my home organizing stuff, you can go to my peaceofmindorganizing.com website. I have a blog there. And if you're interested in my podcast, Getting to Good Enough, about letting go of perfectionism so you can do more of what you love, which I host with Shannon Wilkinson, a life coach, you can go to gettingtogoodenough.com or you can simply... Um, uh, go to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to it. So Esther, that's it. I am done. There we go. I just had to move the boxes around here yeah. on the screen. Um, thank you. That was so helpful. And I see comments here. Louise said, thank you. Very helpful. Uh, Maria said, thank you. Tambra said, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. So I think I think there were so many um, hints and tips that everyone is going to take away. And, and, you know, everyone, I think, will take away different parts of it uh, from today's session, which is just so great. It's so yeah. helpful. 
So you are so you. welcome. And anyone can also check out my blog and do and search on it because all these things are are there, right? Uh, in bits and pieces all over my blog. And as we said, I saw a few questions here about people who came in in the middle and missed some of it. So feel free to rewatch today's session uh, on the My Heritage Facebook page under the videos. It'll be saved there. So if you missed any bits of it or you want to rewatch the whole thing, uh, feel free. So we do have a few questions, if that's okay, Janine, uh, that we'll take from the audience. So the first one is from Tiffany. Uh, she asks, Many Scottish ancestors have a particular naming system, so most names repeat for generations. Sometimes they'll even utilize the same name if an older child passed away and they have a new baby. It can be very confusing. Any suggestions or tips to help with digitally yeah, organizing Yeah, that's a good challenge, them? isn't it? I, I think really using the year of birth and year of death in the file name uh, can make a big difference. I know I have, um, I have a lot of people in my uh, lines made named after US presidents. <laughs> so I have George Washington Adams a couple of times and a John Quincy Adams a couple of times. And um, so I think that can be really helpful. Uh, that's a great way to distinguish. I mean, it's not infallible because you could potentially have the same name born and died in the same year, but it seems unlikely. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a question here from Elaine, and she asked, do you add photos in the same manner oh, Elaine, as your files? that is such a good question. Um, the truthful answer is I haven't done much with photos. And so I don't, um, I, I, I can't tell you what I do because I don't really do it, but I do have some photos that are scanned and named in the same way in, and they're just in the folder of the person. So I think that's one way to do it. If I had a lot of photos, though, I probably would, within the individual person's folder, have a subfolder called photos, and then use the, come up with a file naming protocol that is uh, for photos, um, which might include, instead of the type of document, I would probably maybe put the event, like birthday, you know, I don't know, 30th birthday, Janine Adams, St. Louis, Missouri, and then put it in a folder within my uh, Janine Adams folder. Does that make sense? Janine Adams was a really stupid example because she's not an ancestor of anybody, but um, I hope that's a little bit helpful. I really need to, I do have some photos. Uh, I don't have a lot, um, but, uh, and they're waiting to be processed. <laughs> so. and, you have to and you have to take advantage of all the My Heritage photo tools that we have available. They're oh, good so, point. Boy, the so colorizing. Wonderful. I have used the colorizing. That's amazing. And it's amazing what you can see in those colorized photos that you don't see in the black and white. Exactly. Yeah. And the photo enhancer, which just, you know, brings the photos into focus. And, and sometimes when you use the photo enhancer and the colorization tool together, uh, you know, you just notice all these details that they, they didn't pop out before and and we we hear so many stories of people who found different things in the photo that they just hadn't seen before and and it was there just you know you, you just um you're able to to see it in yeah, a different I watched, light uh, maureen taylor's you use my heritage facebook live was it last month or this month and uh it was amazing the things that came out of the photos that she colorized and enhanced yeah Incredible. Uh, so we have another question here from Elaine. Do you have any advice of organizing all my digital data that I have already saved previously in a haphazard yeah. way? Um, well, I would say set up a, a file naming, I mean, a, a, a file folder structure, and then put those, gather up all those haphazard uh, files, have a file naming protocol and just start renaming them and filing them just one at a time. But I think it's important. And we do this with physical, I do this with my clients with physical papers. It's, um, it's important to get them all together so that you can just start going through them. There's a certain amount of comfort to creating even just a little bit of order out of haphazard by <clears throat> maybe you have a folder that you call documents to be filed and you put them in there and then you just work your way through one at a time. You might set a, a goal of doing one a day 
I mean, that would take you probably just a few minutes, if that, maybe it's 10 a day, but you can get through it little by little and try not to be overwhelmed by having so many and having them scattered. Okay. Okay, we'll take one last question before we get to our winner of the complete plan. So this question is from Heather, uh, similar kind of to the to the other question we asked about Scottish names. So this one is about Scandinavian names. And Heather asks, how do you organize when surnames change each generation? Scandinavian patronymic system. Oh my gosh, that is such a good question, Heather. I have not encountered that because I don't have uh, Scandinavian heritage. Interesting. I would think that I would try to come up with a folder structure that was perhaps by, oh, perhaps by generation, I was going to say, or by family. You know what? I'm going to have to ponder that. I don't know, Heather, but uh, I'm going, am going to think about it. And if I can come up with a system uh, to suggest, I'm going to blog about it because that is a, a challenge. And I'm sure that, you know, obviously many people have it and there are probably many solutions that have come up. I just don't know it. Fascinating. We, we've stumped the uh, national <laughs> organizer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I look forward to figuring it out. <laughs> oh, I love this because, you know, it's just it just shows how many um, difficult situations we can get into with organization and genealogy and just, you know, how many intricacies they are. And it's uh, and, and there's a solution for everything. We just have to find it. Exactly. And, and you don't and don't feel like you have to find the perfect solution. You know, just find a solution. If, if, if you if anybody um, gets caught up in thinking that there's a perfect solution to this problem uh, and they don't find it, then they don't get anywhere. So I'm all about suggesting coming up with a situation, a solution that works for you and then tweaking it as you go along. So I will come up with a suggestion for Heather. Um, and Heather, you if you're still there, you're welcome to email me uh, and I'll make sure I reach out to you when I come up with it, but um, it won't be a perfect solution, it will, but it will be a solution to try. Amazing. We look forward to reading that blog post. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I do see that there were so many fantastic uh, hints and tips from our audience uh, with their great organizational ideas. Uh, a lot of different things here. So definitely all of you out there, feel free to, you know, go through them and see all the different ideas. Cause I think, you know, it can give you just different, uh, different things that, that others have thought of previously. So it's just great to go through them. Yes. And our, our winner of today's uh, My Heritage Complete Plan, the best plan we have to offer at My Heritage, uh, really a fantastic prize. Uh, it goes to Tracy Shadwick Swift. And Tracy wrote to us and she said, I use a whiteboard to keep track of the info that I find on the ancestor that I'm working on. This keeps all the info in front of me at my desk so I don't have to keep flipping through papers or jumping back to my research log when I need to review facts. Oh, that's excellent. Congratulations, Tracy. Congratulations. And Tracy will be in touch with you to claim your prize. Uh, so now I just want to thank you, Janine, for joining us today. This was such a fantastic session, so thorough. And I know that we all gained so much from it. And I, I just see from all the comments coming in how helpful it was to everyone that joined today. So thank you so much. Well, absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope to have you again sometime on our Facebook Live. That would be great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next Facebook Live. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.